Okay, good afternoon, Mr. Diagbo and uh, Madam Silea Tepeni. Salam alaikum. Welcome to the Ah, I hope I enjoy our. Okay. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, sir. Thank you very much, ma. Ah, uh, Mr. Diabu, are you there? Um, I believe you can just go ahead. You have a lot to cover today. And um, since uh, we started, uh, I think we've been waiting for people to join. Sometimes we've waited for about 30 minutes. Yes, yeah, sir. I'm okay, with you. Okay, Thank you very much, sir. Uh, yes. So, what we are still on are uh, the conflict analysis. Like I said yesterday, one of the most important aspects of one becoming a conflict manager. You recall the analogy I gave yesterday, comparing conflict managers uh, with uh, medical doctors. While medical doctors will take care of the health of individuals, of human beings, we take care of the health of society. Because a society that is ridden with violent conflicts, a society that is ridden with violence, um, is on a journey of self-destruction. It will ultimately destroy itself because edifices, edifice, uh, edifice and uh, structures and uh, processes that we build, that will take several years to build, can be destroyed in few minutes or few hours of violent conflict. Of violent conflict. So that's why I said we are social physicians. In fact, that was what John Galton, one of the founding fathers of peace studies, called um, peace workers. Okay, so yesterday we started um, conflict analysis. We started with introductions that we looked at general approach to conflict analysis, what conflict analysis is, why we do conflict analysis, and so on and so forth. And um, we now go to the second part of conflict analysis, which is the practical, practical aspects. And so far yesterday, we looked at conflict view, which I said is a meta tool. Um, I showed us yesterday, I showed us how to use it. Also, we look at the PCAD, uh, the profile, causes, actors, and dynamics of conflict model. And I think we stop at the conflict tree. So the most important thing for us to know about these tools are they are frameworks for us to have a deeper systematic understanding of any conflict you want to intervene in. And you see, you want to solve a problem, the first thing is for you to, to, to understand that problem in depth. The deeper your understanding of a particular problem, the, the more likely you are to solve it the best way possible. That is why conflict analysis is very, very important. That is why conflict analysis tools are there for us to, I mean, are there for, for us to use to help us gain comprehensive, detailed, systematic understanding of the conflict. It is at the period or stage of analyzing a conflict that solutions begin to emerge solution will begin to come up. For instance, the cause of the problem may be misperception or mis mis misinterpretation of information, wrong perception of issues. It is at the level when we are gathering information for conflict analysis that these things will be revealed. So in a sense, in a sense, conflict managers should know should know that uh, managing conflict, managing conflict actually begins, in a sense, at the stage of analyzing conflict. 
conflict management, successful conflict management begins at the stage of analyzing conflicts. And I said that conflict analysis is not something you do once, maybe at the beginning or at the end or in the middle. Anytime we are called upon, we start to do conflict analysis and we keep doing it throughout until the conflict is permanently contained. So, more or less, is a living document that evolves with the conflict. And I've told us the reason why we do that yesterday. So today I'm going to continue with the onion model. This is another framework, another tool for us to gain deeper understanding of conflict. And like I said at the introduction to conflict analysis, onion model is another PIN model, meaning that it falls within the average uh, approach to analyzing conflict. PIN, position, interest, and needs. In other words, when we use the onion model, we want to separate the parties, uh, parties, the, the actors. We want to separate uh, their conflict into their position, what do they say they want, their interest, why do they say they want that, and their needs, what are those things that they must have. Like an onion, conflict has many layers. The outermost layer, that represents the position. And you see, like I said uh, very many times yesterday, you cannot resolve a conflict, you cannot manage a conflict based on parties or actors' position. Underneath their position is their interest. And at the core lies the needs, that is the real issues that control the conflict. Like I said yesterday in one of my illustrations, I said, the woman that is saying I must go out of my husband's house will be because the, or maybe she needs money to do certain things. But at the, at the, at the, at the back or at the root of needing money is the need for financial security. I said yesterday that such a woman, if we find out that if as her children are given scholarship and if she has source of income or sources of income, she may no longer say, I want to go out of my husband's car. I mean, how? She may, she may stop saying that. So, what it means is that as conflict managers, we need to separate uh, people's conflict, people's stance, we need to disaggregate it into their positions, what they say they want, their interests, what they really want, why they want, why they want what they say they want and then their needs, what they must have. And you see from this illustration, see from this illustration, the what one party say they need against militarization, the demand for a free press, equal opportunities, and the investigation of assassinations and human rights violations. That's what they were demanding for. Free press, equal opportunities, and so on and so forth. The other party are saying, we need protection by the security forces and in denial of the rights of the indigenous people. Because once we give them their rights, we begin to ask for more rights. You see, party A, party B. Land on land distribution, redistribution. That is the interest of party A. That's what they really want. Land redistribution. Respect for human rights. Alliance it with other social forces and democracy. Cartier wants political and economic control, access to cheap manual labor, you see, building alliances with municipal and state governments. What do they really need? Cartier really need land, well-being, and justice. You see that if these are guaranteed, if these are provided, if we seize their hostilities, their conflicts, party B, on the other hand, they need land and they need money. So both parties need land. They need land. 
Party B needs money in addition to land. Party A needs well-being and justice in addition to land. So maybe we can come to some sort of arrangement, which could be let's share the land, which could be okay, use this land for a period. You see, you may even find out that their need for land is different. A group may need the land for arable farm for farming. Another group may need it for grazing. And by careful uh, look into their needs, you may find out that the same parcel of land can serve the two people. All, all this depends on how creative we can be in generating options, how creative we can be in making the parties collaborate instead of compete. I said something yesterday that there is no, uh, uh, okay, this is how I said, I said the human mind has um, infinite potential, finite potential to provide solution to human problems. Now, but when people are in conflict, their minds is so polarized, their minds is so focused on the conflict that the resourceful aspect of their minds is kind of put in a seizure, is kind of put under lock because their focus, all their efforts are now channeled towards the conflict, towards winning, towards ruining the other party. However, as mediators, as conflict managers, when we come to the uh, when we come into the into the show, when we come on board, through our competencies, we can help parties um, defreeze, as it were, the aspect of their minds that are resourceful so that they can reach into the infinite potentials of their minds to generate options to solve their own problems. Let's look at the conflict map. This is another conflict analysis tool. Conflict map. Yesterday, I differentiated for us between conflict map and conflict mapping. We looked at conflict mapping yesterday, and I said that one is more or less like a narrative, like building up story about different aspects of conflict. And we saw the different aspects on which we must ask questions, for which we must source for information, for which we must source for data, in order to build uh, a first and no, no, a first level understanding or appreciation of the conflict. And I said that conflict mapping is usually done before the in-depth conflict analysis. The conflict mapping is like for boiling rice before boiling the rice. So, what is different from conflict map? Conflict map is uh, uh, a graphical representation, a pictorial, it's like a picture, a snapshot of what is going on on a conflict at a particular point in time. It's a gra graphical representation of actors in a conflict, their relative power, and the relationship between them. Circles are used to represent the actors. The square boxes are used to represent the issues. The lines, whether dotted or unbroken lines, broken or unbroken lines, are used to show the relationship between the actors. Usually we put arrows there. Arrow shows the direction of influence. We show the head of arrow. Let's see another. So, uh, the visual technique for showing relationship between actors in the conflict. It's like a geographic map, a graphic map that simplifies terrain so that it can be summarized on one page. Okay, said all these. 
the conflict, they have actors and their power or their influence on the conflict, their relationship with each other, and the conflict theme or issues. It enables easy identification of all stakeholders in a conflict. That is the that is the advantage of conflict map. Be able to see all stakeholders easily, all stakeholders in a conflict. So these are the symbols that we use in the conflict map. These are symbols used in conflict map. You see, the author has to put it as conflict map in the, in the conflict map. Or otherwise, the mapping is used in other sense. Yeah. Okay. Circle, the bigger the circle, the bigger the relative power of the party. The circle is used to represent actors. So big circle means actors with relatively high power. Small circle means actors with relatively less power. Straight line means a close relationship. Double line means strong, very strong relationship, like a form of alliance. Dotted line means weak, informal, or intermittent relationship. That is what we use dotted line for. So the straight dotted line between a circle and another circle, it means this the relationship of these two is weak. They are not like allies. Don't forget. The actors could be individuals, they could be organizations, they could be government. Sometimes institutions have relationship with individuals. Institutions have relationship with governments, and so on and so forth. We usually show arrow, like I said, it shows the predominant direction of influence. Zigzag line, it shows discord, conflict. Sometimes we had Lighting both, lighting both of these zigzag lines to show that this is a very hostile, unpredictable, very hot relationship. Cross that line means broken connection, broken connection. Uh, we use half circle or quarter circle to represent external parties, third parties, like conflict managers. Rectangular boxes are the show issues or topics or themes in the conflict. So that is a conflict map. It brings to four key factors for understanding the conflict. It represents a specific viewpoint of the person or group doing the mapping or of a specific conflict situation. As much as possible, it should not be too complex and is a representation of fact at a specific moment in time, just like a photograph, just like a photograph. Conflict map helps us to understand the situation better, helps us to see the relationship between parties more clearly, clarify where power lies, check the balance of one's own contacts and intervention, identify allies and potential allies, identify openings and windows of opportunity for intervention, Evaluates previous previous interventions. So the information we use for conflict mapping can be drawn from. I mean, that use for conflict map can be drawn from the initial conflict mapping that we have done, which is the narratives that we have collected. It could be drawn from information gathered from the PCAID. The the, the profile causes actors and uh, dynamics, all those questions, information we gather from both parties. We can find, if we, we may realize, we may realize that uh, parties, some parties, some parties may be interested in the same issue. You know, it's not every time that conflict only involves two parties, sometimes four or five parties. Two parties may be championing two issues and they may not be aware. But when we listen to them, we may find out that they are interested, I mean their interests align on a particular issue. That's a potential uh, ally. You can let them see 
you are instead of fighting each other, the two of you are actually you have expressed interest on this issue. You have expressed concern. You have similar concern on this issue. So that is how we use conflict map. Yes, this is another tool, the who, what, and how of conflict. The who, what, and how of conflict is also another narrative tool of conflict analysis. Um, we ask questions in key areas of the conflict. Who, what, and how. Who, you know that that will be talking about the people and organization involved. So the key question we ask about the who are, who is involved in the conflict? How do they interact with each other? Where is the conflict centered? What people or groups have strong positive relationships with each other? So when we do the who of conflicts, we can use conflict map. You see, that's why uh, I said yesterday that we use multiple tools. You can't just use one tool or two. In fact, because different to um, different to is used for different components or elements of the conflict. So while we are asking questions about the who, in the who, what, and how of conflict, we can use conflict map to show the actors and the relationships. The what of conflict is about the issues in a conflict. We can use conflict tree. The root causes, they are the root of the conflict, the core, the trunk of the tree, that's the core problem, the effects, the branches and leaves of the tree of the conflict. These are the effects of the conflict. It requires individuals to look at the underlying causes of conflict. Okay, the third aspect is the how of conflict. It identifies the factors that escalate or continue the conflict and the factors that transform or resolve the conflict. Such factors that support the continuation or escalation of conflict may include groups exploiting natural resources for their own profit, under cover of war and violence, political differences, poverty, or history of previous violence between the groups. While we look at the how, while we look at the negative things driving the conflict, we may also identify factors that are supporting transformation or resolution of conflict. That's what I referred to yesterday under PCAD as a local capacities for peace or regulation opportunity, management of a conflict management opportunity. So this will include peace processes, community development of the efforts in war affected region, trading relationships, maybe the parties, they share the same market. Or there are some groups, external groups working to actively promote tolerance and peace. All these are part of the how of conflict. Here is another tool. We call it the three Ps. The three Ps. People, process, and problems. People, process, and problems. So here we ask questions or we, we seek information on the people involved in the conflict, the process of the conflict, and the problem. The people, we look at their relationship, their psychology, their perspective to the conflict, their feelings, their emotions uh, about the problem, about the incompatibility, about the, the, the conflict. So these are the questions we ask under the people who is involved, who are the primary parties in the conflict, who are the secondary parties, how does an individual or group perceive the situation, how do perceptions of the conflict differ between the groups. Problem. What are the specific issues in the conflict and the differences people have between them? What, what is the nature of incompatibility? I remember telling us under understanding conflict that 
you first need to determine the nature of incompatibility. Is it real or only imagined? Is it based on false information? Is it based on mere emotions and not facts? You recall the story of the mother of the four siblings fighting over an orange. The siblings thought the orange is mutually exclusive until the mother listened to them and found out that one orange could satisfy the needs, the interests of the four of them. Now we come to the problem. Questions to ask include what are the issues in the conflict? What are people fighting over? What are the underlying needs of the various parties in conflict? Do any mutually acceptable criteria or processes for decision making exist? What might be some, some of the common values or interests in the conflict? It's important we look at commonalities in the conflict because when we intervene in conflict, we are many times tempted on, uh, to see only the negative. Only the negative. But if you look closely well, you will see that within the conflict itself, within the context of the conflict, there are opportunities we can take advantage of. Maybe the people, they share the same religion. Maybe they are from the same ethnic group. Maybe they are in the same trade union. All these things can be tapped into to resolve the conflict. Process. What are the ways decision gets made and how people feel about it? Process of decision making in a conflict is often a key cause. For instance, people may resent how decisions are made. Maybe they are not carried along, they are excluded from the decisions. And that is why they are becoming uncooperative and disruptive of things. Questions to ask on that process include what are the methods used? To resolve conflict. Are groups using violence or is the conflict playing out in other ways? Demonstration, protest, legal battle. What phase, what stage of the conflict are we? How are, how are the behaviors of the parties influencing or changing the dynamics of the conflict? Um, I need to bring this to our attention. You see, as important as our participation in class is, it is also very important that we participate in our group activities. We have been given materials, um, like uh, some days uh, before the training, or less almost a week before the training, and we have been grouped. Um, into five groups are uh, five. We had uh, about twelve groups. Um, the purpose is for us to be able to prepare for some group activity during the course and even post course. But because of the attendance rate so far, I'm not sure whether any group has up to two people attending the program, attending the class at a time. That's why doing a conflict analysis with activity now may not be possible. But um, part of this course is pre-course and post-course, pre-course, in-course and post-course activity, activities. The course is not complete unless you participate in, in, in all this. It's not complete. So I want to ask, how many groups, out of all of us that are here now, how many of us have we been working on our pre-course activities? Uh, Mr. Diagbo, Every one of us will talk. I need everybody to tell me what they have been doing or what they have not been doing, or whether they have been doing anything at all in their groups concerning the pre-course, in-course, and uh, post-course activities. I'm going to start with Mr. Diagbo, then I will go to 
Madame Adeko Jalima, then Madame Akinwale Omouni, then Mr. Ibrahim Fatai, then Madame Al Oladejo Al Ghazal, Akirat, and then finally, uh, okay, Mr. Wahid, no, Madame Wahid, Silia Tokayemi. So, Mr. Diago, over to you, please. What has your group been doing about the group activities? Please unmute before you go. Hello, Mr. Diago. Okay, Madam Adepoju Alima. Okay, Mr. Diago is on now. Mr. Diago, please let's see your let's see your face. Please. Okay. Please let everybody put on their camera. I want to take attendance now. We take attendance intermittently. Please let's put on our camera. Okay, so Mr. Diago, please go ahead. Tell us what your group has been doing, the group activities. Ah. <laughs> uh, so far, I don't think you've done anything. Okay. So I don't, <laughs> we've not done anything, sir. Okay. Please, uh, everybody put on your camera, Madam Adepo Dualima, Madam Shakirat, Madam Wahid Siliat. Okay, over to you, Mrs. Alima. Let's hear what your group has been doing. Apart from the first, uh, first class that we have, the first lecture, hmm. that we, before the lecture, rather, okay. they, we discuss in our group. Only, even, even only myself and the group leader that we discuss. That's Sister Khadija. Uh, oh. So after that, we don't have anything in the group at all. Okay, thank you very much. Madam Miriam, one more with me. Please unmute. Let's hear you what your group has been doing. Assalamualaikum, Tulaisa. Yes, ma. Wa alaikum salam. So, uh, we've not done anything because the group leader haven't told us anything. Like on my own, I started, but we were having power failure. That's why I couldn't do anything much. But I started some things on my own. Okay, thank you very much. Yes. Madam Shakira Taladevi al Ghazal. Um, just like the others, there has been no activity. I don't think any of my group members are here. The first day I saw one person that, but subsequently, and I went to the group to ask about the activity. The other day, we were given one particular activity concerning the phrases that we're supposed to talk about. But uh, they said there was no response. So I think I'm the only one seeing myself here. Yeah. So I don't know if you want us to do those things personally or if we are to be recruited or something. So that's why nothing has been done. Okay. Thank you very much, Ma. Um, Madam Adefoji, Madam Wahid. Oh, Mr. Ibrahim, sorry, Mr. Ibrahim Fatai. Salam alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Wa alaikum salam, sir. Just like uh, every other uh, participant, you have not been able to do any group on your own. Uh, but the last time I tried to reach out to the to our group leader, but without any uh, sources. So it's like right from the first day, I've been the only member of the group that has been attending the program. So I've not been able to have any 
kind of uh, discussion with uh, any other members of the group. Okay. That's the day of it. Okay. But what's your group, sir? Group six. Group six. Okay, madam. Yes. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh to everyone. Wa alaikum salam. Um, I'm from group seven. Okay. So far, we've not really done anything on the group. There was even a time I was trying to reach out to the group member, trying to, I say, I said Teslim on the group with the intention of probably reaching out to the, uh, reaching out to the group um, leader, but unfortunately, no one has responded so far. So I don't know if you can just help us reach out to all these group members. Probably we can push from there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, moms and sirs. Um, like I said earlier, you see, group activities are critical aspects of the course. I've noticed that those of us are attending today we attended, I mean, we have been, we have been the uh, regular attendees, uh, regular attendees. So what I'm going to do uh, with my team members is that at the end of the program today, we're going to group those of you that are here, that have been attending, group you separately. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, I think we've had maybe seven regular attendees, sometimes eight, nine. I will check. Uh, that's my other staff also to check, my teammates to check. And I'm going to group you maybe into two groups to satisfy that aspect of the course. Because some of these things we are teaching, uh, you will, you will develop the skills when you do them yourself. And the certificate you are issuing with the transcripts behind it, uh, or the, it's gonna describe the course content so that people, once they see you have a certificate on foundation course in conflict management, they will know how rigorous the work is, they will know what you went through, they will know the activities you went through and the skills you develop so that they will know the weight of the certificate you are carrying. For instance, some of the people that are joined that have showed interest, one of the things you said for not showing up again is that they never knew the course is going to be this intensive. And some of you also said it yesterday that maybe that's why some people dropped off. Uh, maybe they just thought it's something light. We need to show the weight of the certificate. That is why we need to describe the activities uh, at the reverse side of the certificate. And that's why we are saying that we are going to be grouped and you are going to do those activities, even if it is new, if it means uh, submitting after the course. That is how it is designed to be anyway. Um, you see, there's an activity on. Um, on conflict analysis, where you are asked to pick conflicts in the Holy Quran or Adits and use a combination of conflict analysis tools to analyze who are the actors in this conflict, what are their issues. You understand? Uh, historical conflicts. Conflict that has happened maybe during the time of, uh, of the prophet or uh, immediately afterwards, you see, such conflict, you, use, you now analyze it. it. In a group, you will select, this is what you want to do. You will choose one conflict. And then you use several, I mean, a number of conflict analysis tools to analyze it jointly on WhatsApp group. We also will be part of the group as observers. We want to monitor those people who are contributing and who are not contributing. Because sometimes in group work, some people do free riding. They won't do anything and they want to be awarded uh, 
the mark of the group. You see, we don't encourage free riding in our course. Everybody must participate because it is in participation that you build the requisite skills. So that when you carry our certificates to some places, oh, you want to apply your trade, you want to say, I'm now a concrete manager, I can do this. You want to ensure that you can do it truly. You see, that is why group participation, I mean, participation in group activity is very, very important. And we put mechanisms in place to ensure that you participate or to know people who participated and the level of participation of people. For instance, a group of leaders we trained in February. In judging their participation, all we have to do is to download their chats, WhatsApp chats in that group because we belong, we even created the group. So we just went through the chat to see who contributed what, at what time, who are frequent contributors, you see? Because some people will be in the group and, and say nothing and do nothing. And at the end of the day, they want to hand the mark of the group. No, you won't do that. So for those of us that have been attending regularly, please let us participate very well in the group activities, the in-course, pre-course, and um, post-course. After we have successfully participated and we have issued you certificates, we also put your name on our website that social person participated in this course and this is the, these are the contents of the course you participated in. You participated in it, in it successfully. So that when you take your certificate anywhere, you can always refer them to our website to check, to confirm that you truly were our alumni, as it were. So, because this is a foundational course, and I can tell you that it's one of the most intensive courses, and it lays a solid foundation for you. I train with local and international organizations, and I've been doing training for about uh, over 20 years, 21 years now, About 21 years. And the content we are delivering to you, uh, I mean, they are one of the best, one of the very, very best. But it was built on the experience we gathered in other places. So I said all this to let you know that you have a lot to gain in participating to the hand fully. So, uh, having said that, let's uh, continue with our with our class. We are on uh, group activity. Can we all see my uh, screen, please? Can we see my screen? Yes. Great. yes. Great. Thank you. So oh, um, I have a question. Okay, please go ahead, man. Yes, go so proceed. Um, 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 I want to ask, I I I observe that the pre-course uh, materials that were given to us, the materials that were sent to our email, there are some conflict, uh, there are some uh, activities there. Mm -hmm. Yes. Sorry, there are some activities that are there. While as we go on with the first two, some also pop up. So are they really the same or, or we are going to do them together? I, I got confused a little bit. Um the activities in the pre, uh, in the course material sense, they are grouped into three. There is a pre-course. One of the precursor activities is for you to, in a group, come up with five words that come to mind when you hear the word conflict. It's a precursor activity. And you're supposed to present it during the course. 
Uh, but we have passed that stage. Now, the other group of activities in course activities from presentations we're supposed to do during the course. And one of that is uh, this understanding the language of conflict through metaphor. Each group has been assigned a particular metaphor for them to come and present. They will discuss it among themselves in the group, the meaning of the metaphor, and then they will present it uh, during the course. I will have given them two, two minutes to present it. Then we have the post-course activities. The post-course activity is the one I just explained now. Pick a conflict in the hadith or a contemporary conflict that everybody understands very well and analyze it. So that one is supposed to be submitted after the course. Now, the submission after the course will now include all the three. The pre-course, your answer to the pre-course, your answer to the in-course, and your solutions, rather, solutions to the post-course. It's now being form of a typed Word document attached to our email and sent to us. This is our record to back up whatever grades, whatever certificates we are giving you. That oh, Madam so 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 participated. We have the video recording to prove that she also did all the activities. We have the submission to prove that. You see, all these are for quality assurance in the kind of service education we, we provide. Is that clear, ma'am? It is all right. Yes, thank okay. you. Thank you very much. So another tool is the ABC triangle. I introduced it briefly yesterday. It was uh, given to us by John Galton in 1969. A stands for attitude, B for behavior, and C for context. Like I said yesterday, there's supposed to be arrow. I don't know whether I present, oh, the one with arrow is not here. There's supposed to be arrow from one point like arrow coming from A to C, and another arrow line, an arrow going from C to A, and then also from A to B, and another arrow from B to A, also from B to C and C to B. What those arrows are saying is that all these three vertices, they influence themselves, they interact with themselves. Like A, the attitude of the parties will inform their behavior, and when their behavior is changed, it will also change the context, the environment. For instance, if a, a, an actor has a negative attitude, that negative attitude to the other actor or to the issue will reflect in how it behaves. That behavior, that negative behavior may trigger a, a negative response from the other part, uh, other actor too. And then their, their environment is more charged with negative thing, with negative vibe, with negative energy. So ABC Triangle helps us to identify this attitude. Uh, I think I need to update uh, that triangle and show us. Yes, uh, we sent you two or three. Hello. We sent you two or three uh, tri ABC triangles that we used to analyze some conflict. I, I will go to that now, but let me finish explaining. Okay. They actually represent positions, emotions, and views of the other. Behavior, the way we, we respond to a particular situation of stimulus. That is outward expression of attitude in the form of support, attack, agitation, demand, plea, or violence. Now, the context means the background or environment within which attitude and behavior is developed and are played out. Since attitude, behavior, and context can impact on each other, ABC Triangle helps to know how and where to intervene and what to do to break the vicious cycle, cycle of pain. 
In a conflict, the violent behavior we see has its roots in people's attitude and the political economic context. We should complete one triangle for each of the major groups involved in the conflict. Now, let me, let's quickly look at an example of uh, a triangle, of an ABC triangle. These, as I said, have been provided before. These are supposed to be part of what we have looked into uh, during the in preparation for the course. Um, okay, like uh, I will come back to that in order to save time. The folder where I kept it, okay, okay, is open. I'm hearing you. Yes. I'm the only one. Yes. Um, I'm not seeing anything yet. I'm trying to open an ABC triangle for us to, to see how it looks like when we use it for conflict analysis. Already, they have been sent. I sent two ABC triangles to, to us. Yes. Uh, I don't know whether any one of us have uh, checked them in the sent materials and we have seen what they look like. Aha, it has opened. Let me, let me now share it. Can we see it? How many of us are you seeing my screen? Yes. Uh -huh. Yes, you can see it. Okay. That is a word or a, a used ABC triangle. Conflict analysis by ABC triangle model. You see, farmers view of pastoralists, these these are these are conflict between pastoralists and farmer. Mm -hmm. On the right hand, you see farmers' views of pastoralists. Mm -hmm. On the left hand side, you see pastoralists' view of themselves. Uh, that's about their attitude. The context, pastoralists, their context, lack of land for grazing, which cause their displacement, lack of water points for for herbs, uh, lack of cattle dips, tenure insecurity, you see their behavior. So this just to show that this is how uh, we use ABC triangle. This is how we use ABC triangle in analyzing conflict. You can use to analyze the conflict between a husband and a wife, between a group and another, between a state and another. So please, uh, at least there are two used ABC triangles that I sent to us. And also there is a more detailed explanation of ABC triangle uh, is a two-page material. A two-page material, that's another one. So to master it, 
you can just go back at the end of the at the end of the training to to look more in depth at the at this. Okay, so let me share the the um PowerPoint again so that we continue. Okay. So this is another tool, timeline. Timeline is a tool of gra of concrete analysis that illustrates graphically the events and how they evolve over time. It shows chronological order of events that led to the state of conflict as of date. Excuse me, as a, as timeline, the emphasis is on how events go with time, how they evolve with time. And we gather information from both sides of the conflict. It helps us to understand the real issue at stake and the history of the case with dates. And it unharks remote causes. It facilitates understanding of the trend, the conflict, and perception of people involved in it. The purpose of the timeline is to provide information about the history of the conflict, to show different views of the conflict at particular time, clarify and understand each party's perception of events as it evolves with time, identify which events are most important or significant to each party, and is a way of helping parties accept their own perspective as only a part of the truth, that is one side of the coin. As also a particular date, when you are doing this, the other party was doing it, doing this. When you are interpreting this this way, the other party was interpreting it this way. So it's like a factual presentation of events plotted against time, against time. That's why we call it timeline. So the emphasis there is on how events evolved with time. Um, another tool is the pillars. Pillars. Uh, in this case, the idea is that conflict is supported by certain pillars for it to be continuing. And that unless we remove those pillars that are sustaining the conflict, the conflict will persist. Pillars could be intolerance, fanatism, misunderstanding, bigotry, misinformation, discrimination, or illiteracy. Once we identify pillars supporting a particular conflict, then we begin to work on the pillars. We begin to work on removing the pillars. Removing the pillars may not be something sudden. It may be gradual. The important thing is that we are working on removing that or those pillars. For instance, many people believe that terrorism in the Northeast is uh, based or is supported by pillars like um, poverty, pillars like lack of education or poor education, fanatism, fanatism, intolerance. So what do we do? We can put up a program, free education, or even paid education. This is what I mean by paid education. You are paying people to come to school in order to educate them. You are, you may now send out um, sound Islamic scholars who will remove the fanatism, who will let them know that you don't have to kill another person. You don't have to be violent. You don't have to be a terrorist and say you are serving the cause of Allah. You see? And um, at some point, I mean, some, some maybe two or three years back, when I was having this kind of training, physical, somewhere, one of the participants was from the Northeast and he said that one of the things that is still making Boko Haram to be strong then, I think it was about three years now, to be strong then was because Boko Haram still go around the villages talking to people in their own language. 
and that government has now also woken up now. You no longer just talk to them in uh, Hausa. Say, Fufu Day, this is the language that is, I mean, you talk in Kanuri, in Fufu Day, in this one, in that one, on the radio. So because an average man, Fulani or Hausa, they, they go around with their radio. And it is whatever their preacher is saying on, on the radio that they want to follow. But if a, a preacher is talking to them in a language that they don't understand, or that they don't cherish, so government now also has to send its own agents, preachers, scholars to go and reorientate these people, to go and give them the real, the real education, not the not the the, the fanatic version of the interpretation of the Holy Quran. So that is trying to remove one of the pillars. So when we use the pillars analysis tool to analyze conflict, what we are saying is that we want to identify this, the, the underlying uh, structures supporting this thing, the, the, the root causes of this thing, so that we can remove the pillar or weaken it. Okay, sometimes there are certain challenges against conflict analysis. One challenge is time. We want to see that, oh, conflict, this conflict is, is degenerating, is escalating. Do I have time? Won't I be wasting time when I say I want to do conflict analysis? Don't do that because you may escalate, you may worsen the conflict by jumping in without proper analysis. Sometimes you don't want to say, I don't, this stage of conflict, how do I, how do I engage? Because the way the conflict is going, it will affect collection of data. People will be, will be giving me something, I mean, so, so, uh, a way, so, so, I mean, so, so, not the reality. Maybe because somebody, uh, I mean, has reached a level of escalation, some drastic cataclysmic stuff has been done that is making people, I mean, hungry. In spite of that, we still need to do conflict analysis. Okay. Sometimes the behaviors of stakeholders. Uh, sometimes the trigger is more important than whatever, than the trends and indicators. For whatever the reason, irrespective of the challenges, conflict analysis must be done. Even when it is difficult, when we cannot totally interpret the behaviors of stakeholders. Small information or distorted information is still better than no information at all. Okay, sorry, somebody sent a message chat. I'm being disturbed by network. It's just sending me a time. Oh, okay, oh, Madam Adepoji. Sorry, everything will be well. Don't forget that we put the, the class online. We put it online for you to be, so that you make up for uh, the parts you need. Yes, it is important that we mainstream gender in conflict analysis. Gender mainstreaming in conflict analysis is the norm, is a standard. In other words, you see, sometimes when people, when some people hear the word gender, gender balance, gender equality, gender mainstreaming, they say, ah, they have started again, they have come again, no, women just want to take over child. That is not it. Gender mainstreaming is saying that we need to collect the perspective of male and female, of boys and girls, of men and women over any particular issue. We need to collect perspectives of male and female. We need to factor male and female interest into whatever we are doing in fact is a is the golden rule 
is a golden rule in conflict analysis. Why? Because the way men and women experience a day is totally different. We are in different worlds when it comes to that. While a man is thinking of how to get more money to pay this, to do that, to come, the woman is thinking of, oh, what do we eat? What do we do this? How do we ensure that? I mean, our worlds on a particular day are so, so different. And more importantly, the way men and women, the way female and male experience conflict is different. Their roles as conflict uh, promoters, their role as peace promoters, totally different. I mean, gender specialists have researched into it, the role men and women have written papers on it, have done advocacy on it. I tell you, the way women contribute to or promote conflict or violence or peace is different from the way men do it. So, whatever analysis we are doing, we must make sure that as we talk to men on this side, we talk to few women on this side. As we talk to boys on this side, we talk to girls on this side. And as we talk to men and women, boys and girls, female and male on this side, I mean, we talk to both parties. Without that, without that, any analysis, any, any prognosis, or any diagnosis that come from our analysis will be one-sided, will be male-sided. For instance, you enter a community now and you just want to talk to the male leaders. Oh, the conflict between this mosque and that mosque, are not only talking to the imams of the mosque, no. You must talk to a genie of the mosque, in the mosque, the women leaders in the mosque. As we talk to, as we interview uh, five men in the mosque, talk to five or at least four women. If, if male population is higher than, uh, than female, the most important thing is that we capture the views, the perspectives of both gender. We capture the perspective of both gender. That is the only way we can have rich data on which we can base our analysis. Societies are made of male and female. People are born female and male who learn to be boys and girls and grow into men and women. I'm a gender uh, specialist. I teach gender to the graduate and postgraduate. I train on gender advocacy. I know that this thing is real. I, I research into gender too. This thing is real. So please, whether you believe in gender equality or equity or whatever, it is now customary to do a gender disaggregated analysis in your conflict analysis. Okay. Um, we are to do a practicum or practical in conflict analysis. Uh, my plan initially was to pick one of the cases we will have done in our group and then use it uh, as a case study. So now that the groups have not been meeting, can we suggest uh, a case, a conflict situation that we can in a few minutes talk about or analyze rather? That could be maybe we should pick a contemporary conflict. That is a conflict that is happening. Uh, for instance, we can use our election. Election. Is that okay by us? Yeah, it's okay. 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 So. It's okay. Oh, great. Yeah. Okay. Let, let's, let's now make our mic. Let's, let's uh, unmute. 
so that as I ask the question, we can give our, our responses. Now, who are the, in the just concluded election, who are the primary parties? You know, who are the actors? The actors are now broken into primary, secondary, shadow parties, and so on. Who are the actors? Madam Akimale. Okay. Who are the actors? Okay, okay. Mr. Ibrahim, then. Okay. Okay. Sam Alikwa. Sam Alikwa. Okay. Wa alikwa sala. After you, Mrs. Akwa. I, I think in the. Do I do I have the floor? Yes, please go ahead. Okay. In the just concluded uh, presidential election, I think uh, the the primary actors is the political parties that are involved in the in the election. Yes. Then. The the presidential candidates representing the each of these political parties. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then, uh, by extension, then we look at the members of that uh, political parties as part of the primary actors. Mm -hmm. Then the the electorate. We come under the secondary actors. Okay, the voters. And the voters, that's what I mean by the electorate. Hmm. Are they really secondary? Okay, we will we, we give us a, we will explain to us. Okay, go ahead, please. Okay, then the, the, the INEC. The organizers of the election, uh -huh. they are equally primary yes. actors. Uh -huh. Then the observers, uh -huh. the ele 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 election uh, monitoring uh, group, yes, yeah. and they, they come at the secondary. Secondary actors. Okay, let's hold on. Let's let's hear from other people too. Uh, okay, Madam, sir. thank you, sir. Madam Akimale, sorry I caught you the other time. Yes, I was trying to say the political parties, the, the INEC officials. Political parties are the primary. Yes, you are correct. Okay, yes. let me ask this. Um, Mr. Fata has helped us with the primary and some secondary. Maybe we can identify more if we have the time. Uh, but let me ask who are the shadow parties in this election? Shadow parties. Shadow parties are the elect and um, what do you call it? Mm -hmm. I hope you remember the the description of shadow parties. They are people who have illegitimate stake. They have stake in the outcome of the conflict, but they prefer the conflict to go, I mean, in a way that favors them, kind of. As long as the conflict okay. is ongoing, mm. you see? Uh, yeah. Salam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam, sir. Okay, I think we can uh, look at the religious bodies as one of the shadow uh, parties. As well as uh, the different 
ethnic uh, groups. Ethnic groups. Mm. Mm. Okay. Um. Not. Uh, you, you have to justify why they are like that. Okay. Uh, but while you are thinking about it, while you are thinking about, let's hear out, Madam Oladejo Shakirat. I see your hand up. Please unmute. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, I've mentioned the primary uh, actor in the, in the election. I just want to include that uh, the international observers are uh, more like secondary actors. Then the shadow actors, politicians, so politicians are shadow actors because some of them are pulling uh, some reactions, playing on people to, to cause some uh, unrest that will favor their, that will be to their own game. Mm -hmm. Then just like uh, Mr. Ibrahim has said, and Mr. Patai has said, uh, some ethnic uh, gods are also shadow mm -hmm. actors. Have ulterior motives, or they are playing on the intelligence of the youth, exactly. especially uh -huh. because of the state of the nation. Mm -hmm. They are rubbing their, their finger in their their brain mm -hmm. so to direct their action towards uh, their own to their own benefit. Mm -hmm. And also, well, mm -hmm. their religious is part of it because some has their own uh, motive too. Mm -hmm. uh, religious, but majorly, I think those uh, ethnic and the politicians. Okay. Um, the observers are they secondary party? Okay. Uh, okay. This this group now. Uh, international. I mean, foreign governments like the UK, US government. What? What? Uh, how do you categorize them? Yeah, shadow. They they can also be shadow because I think they also have their interests too. Yeah, don't uh, forget. I don't think. Um, I don't think they will. Are they shadow or secondary? I, I they can be both. To me, from my mm. own uh, my own analysis of the situation, can be both. They are secondary. Physically, the one we are seeing is that they are secondary. They are not mm. actually. The primary actors, at least they are there, they are monitoring. But in the, in another sense of it, they are also shadow because they have their own interests too. Some uh, believe they, they will gain from a Nigeria that is not stable. So they might be working towards that. Okay. Well, well, I don't know if some has the positive um, uh, intention. Um, yeah, uh, I'm glad we are really getting it. Um, Although you see, in reality, when we do this, we give more time to it. We collect information in order to be able to accurately place each group. I mean, each actor in the appropriate. But some, some are just obvious. The primary actors, the secondary, uh, the judiciary, Nigerian judiciary. What role are they likely to play eventually? How can we categorize them? Primary, secondary, third party, shadow. Third party. Third party. I yeah. think they are third party. Third party. Yes, and because they resolve a crisis or conflict. Exactly. In with the third party. And we see that in each political party, you have extremists, you have spoilers, people who are very strong views, whose only motivation is let's just scatter everything. Um, some small groups in each political party especially the political parties that are, are lost, and you have people like that. They are calling for the edge of everybody. They just want blood to flow. Some of them, 
we identify them through the activities, through what they have been posting, you see? In conflict analysis, all this must be taken care of. All this, must, I mean, taken into consideration in understanding the conflict. In understanding the conflict and in planning the appropriate strategies, appropriate intervention into the conflict. So, uh, because of time, we may not be able to go beyond this. Um, uh, we, need to, we need to go and, uh, over the next module. So, we have come to the end of conflict analysis. Once again, thank you for your attention. And uh, let's make sure that we never want to do uh com we never want to manage any conflict let's remember that conflict analysis is a very very critical aspect anytime you bring the conflict to you whether the conflict is interpersonal intra-group or intergroup or whatever know that you are sitting in the position of a social physician a medical doctor of the society who must carry out necessary diagnosis, or first of all, must collect uh, necessary information, data, to build his diagnosis, prognosis, um, propose uh, his uh, treatment for the patient. So I want to thank you very much. Um, I'm going to end this now. Okay, let me just, um, I'm going to stop the recording now, and then we move to the next uh, module. Thank you.